like I went from, you know, eking out a profit of $200 to $100 a month per, per, you know, property to having one booking bringing $3,000, one booking, like a, you know, five day booking, $3,000. And it's like, where has this been this whole time? Plus, and then I heard about the tax benefits yeah. and I'm like, people aren't hearing enough about this and not everybody will come sit in a, you know, a 12 week program or, or, a, you know, a six month or a one year mastermind. No, but everybody, like I said out loud that every doctor needs a Doris. Welcome to the Physicians and Properties Podcast. The show where we teach you how investing in real estate can give you the freedom to practice medicine and live life how you want. Doctor. 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 Now, here's your host, Dr. Alex Schlow. Welcome to another episode of the Physicians and Properties Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Alex Schlow. And as always, I'm so glad you're here listening to another episode. Today's guest was an awesome one. Dr. Chiagozi Fallaway is a pediatric anesthesiologist and real estate investor. Her real estate investing journey was incredible and very interesting, and she has some incredible stories. She has a little bit of experience in all kinds of different avenues of real estate investing. She got started with long-term investing, doing a fix and flip. Then she bought a multifamily property that actually caught on fire. Stay tuned for that story. It's crazy. Then she started doing Burr investing duplexes. And then she pivoted into rental arbitrage in the short-term rental space, which now she predominantly focuses on short-term rental investing. She's also authored a recent book that is an Amazon bestseller called the STR Blueprint. She loves short-term rentals and she is an incredible person. This episode is going to be very helpful for folks who are interested in learning about short-term rentals. And we also talk a lot about how short-term rentals can help offset your taxable income and how there's an incredible tax benefit to investing in the short-term rental space. This was a really fun episode that flew by. So without any further ado, let's get started with today's episode with Dr. Chiagozi Fallaway. So good to see you tonight on the podcast. Thanks for staying up late all the way from Syracuse, New York, top on the Physicians and Properties podcast. So glad you're here. How are things going? Going very well. It's definitely my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Can't wait. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Well, thanks for being flexible too. I had a time booked and then we went on a ski trip and I forgot to block the calendar. So I apologize. Wouldn't have been a very good interview from the top of a mountain. So no. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, how, how's everything going? Going well. Going good. well. We are in winter. I mean, of course it's it's winter up here in Syracuse, yeah. so you will think that, that that things will be dead with the short-term rentals, but they're yeah. still going, so I am a happy person. <laughs> good, good. That's awesome. Well, I definitely want to dive into that in the short-term rental space because you're crushing it there, but if you don't mind, would, do you mind just telling the audience a little bit about yourself? Okay, sure. Yeah, so I'm Thiago Zedfavale. I am a pediatric anesthesiologist based in the Syracuse, New York area, and it's funny that I still say that, that I am that because I am peds trained. Well, peds anesthesia trained, but right now I actually work at a facility that barely has any peds, but it's almost like it's still my badge nonetheless, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm based in Syracuse, New in the Syracuse metro area, married with three kids, three girls, and run a couple of businesses. And one of the, uh, the one that people know the most will, will be our savvy docs in real estate, yeah. uh, where I also work with other doctors trying to build, build you know, wealth with, with, with real estate. But I, I think I can officially call myself a serial entrepreneur right now because now we've done long-term rentals, we flipped, now we're doing short-term rentals, and it's been a, an interesting journey doing all of that. That's awesome. Well, peds anesthesiology, you know, I, I, I have people all the time that are like, oh, kids are just little adults, right? And I'm like, no, that's absolutely yeah. not the case. <laughs> so I know that you know all about that, and I'm sure... You know, even just for me, I don't see, I probably see 20% peds in my practice and, you know, always the weight-based medications and everything else. I'm always so anxious every time, like about the calculations and so forth. I am, so I'm sure. I am currently living the reality that kids are not just small adults because <laughs> yeah. I, and I recently actually just changed my, my job and now I'm dealing with more adults and I'm like, it's almost like learning anesthesia all over again. Yeah. Like, what is this? You know, yeah. like I've done this for seven years now. Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and sometimes the adults act like kids and make it a little more difficult. So <laughs> that too, that yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. 
but you have the great job of being able to put them asleep. So that, that helps. They start talking back. You Everything can just put them to you sleep. Fix with a little push. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So three girls in the house. How is your husband doing? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's actually so his mom is also around with us. So okay. he's doing very fine. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's actually doing pretty well. So yeah, it's, it's five of us females and just him. But yeah, yeah. You know, they're all daddy's girls. And I bet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, how did you get started investing in real estate? So my journey actually started during residency. Okay. Awesome. And it's funny when I tell my story, I kind of chuckle sometimes because a lot happened around pregnancy and delivery. My first, my first aha epiphany, should I say, was when I was expecting my first daughter. I happened to be home alone. My husband was, was out of the country at the time. And before this, I had been sort of just thinking, praying about ideas because I just wanted to do something outside of medicine. And I didn't know what. So now I'm sitting on my couch watching Flip or Flop and Tarek and Christina on HGTV, they were able to turn a property from like, you know, this horrible looking thing into an amazing property. They flipped the home in about three months and they made like $60,000. Now, at the time, my entire salary was $54,000 a year. So it was like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> These yeah. guys just made my entire annual salary in one deal. What am I doing? And they didn't have to like, you know, miss kids event. Their kids were involved in the show. Of course, it had to be like it was on TV, isn't it? Isn't, isn't, isn't all realistic like, like HGTV, right? Right. And I was like, wait, I don't know what they're doing, but I need to go find out what they're doing and figure it out. And so that kind of took me down a rabbit hole, a good rabbit hole I found. Then I found on bigger pockets. Then and I was so consumed with all realistic stuff. Yeah. Eventually got my first deal done about a year and a half, about a year and a couple of months later still doing residency but that year in between was just spent like you know on the forums in books all the podcasts finally did my first deal all the way down in norfolk virginia about 300 miles away if you want to do yeah. that math because i was in brooklyn new york and that first deal ended up being a, a flip just like i had seen on tv right yeah and it was a single family home foreclosure i think it was a bank of america or something that was selling it at the time and I basically put the deal together from Brooklyn, New York, while my dad was the boots on the ground person okay. down in Virginia. But that was our first deal. And that basically kind of got me off to the races. I obviously ended up doing other deals after that, which, 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 which we, we can go into. Yeah. But that was how I, I cut the bug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how it starts, that first deal. And then the snowball starts rolling down the hill. Are you from Virginia originally or what are the ties to Virginia? So we, when we first came to the United States back in yeah. 2004, we lived in, in PG County in Maryland. Yeah. And so I did, I, I did undergrad at Howard in DC and then med school in Maryland at, at Hopkins. So yeah. I basically spent somewhere close to 10 years in Maryland, but then my family moved just before I started med school. Okay. So my, so my, my like home base was in Maryland or wasn't in Virginia while I was in med school. So that was, that was the only, you know, but I mean, in terms of like living there, I think I only lived like really lived, lived in Virginia for about yeah. maybe eight months before med school. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, I'm from Virginia originally. Oh um, yeah, what part? Yeah, I went to, went to undergrad in Newport News, Virginia, at Christopher Newport University. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. So familiar with the Norfolk area, and then med school in, in Richmond, Virginia, at Medical College of oh, Virginia. Wow. So nice. yeah, definitely familiar with that. But uh, yeah, Norfolk, that's a great. Well, probably you know, I'm I'm sure that house has done well because that area has definitely uh, taken off a little bit. And uh, there's some parts of Norfolk that are really cool, like the Ghent area and so forth. It was fun to explore when we were in college. Yeah, North, well, that, that first deal ended up being more of an education because yeah. it was a flip, right? So it wasn't right. like a buy and hold type of thing that, 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 yeah. that, I, could, that, that I could participate in the long-term right. upside. It yeah. was a, you know, buy it, fix it, flip it. Yeah. And we didn't make money on that one. Let's just, let's just leave it at, at that. Well, <laughs> but it still got the ball rolling. It, 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 it was any... education. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it was your tuition. Um, it was my you... tuition. That's what I always say. <laughs> So didn't make, you did not make money on that first flip, but first what, what were your thoughts? Like, were, were you like, Hey, I'm done with real estate. This stinks. Obviously not because here we are now, but what were your kind of thoughts as that process was going on? So, so while that was going on, I realized, okay, well, this may be a little riskier than I had initially thought or planned, but at this point I was knee deep in the forums. So I happened to have stumbled upon, I think it was Michael Blank, my material. On bigger pockets, and he was talking then about 
you know, the benefits of multifamily, how multifamily kind of gave you the nice heads that you could like buy one property that had five or 10 tenants and all. And if one person left and it didn't really affect everybody else, I was like, you know what? This whole multifamily thing may actually be a better idea than the flip that I was doing. And so I then said, okay, fine. It's, it, it'll be multifamily. But here's the kicker though. I had no money. I didn't even have money for the first yeah. deal. Okay. The first deal was borrowed. I mean, it was, it was, it was partnership money. Like my, my dad yeah. and I partnered on that, on, on that first deal. Yeah. So to talk about multifamily, having no money was almost like, okay, but I wasn't crazy because the very, among the very first few books that I read when I first got started was the book by Brandon Turner called how to invest in real estate with low or no money down. Yeah. So that book basically popped, like just popped the lid yeah. of you have no money, so you can't invest. So that was like totally out of my vocabulary. Basically he made me understand that. In real estate, if you're not getting deals done, it's not because you can't, it's because you don't want to. Yeah. Okay. So having learned all the different strategies, I was, like, oh, oh, oh. I was like, okay, fine. There's a way. And apparently when you're buying multifamily, you even need less of your own money because if you use other people's money and if you can find a good deal, other people's money can safely be used to buy the asset. So that became my, my plan. And I ended up getting a, a 12 unit apartment complex this time in, in Rochester, New York, as my very first rental property. We also ended up closing on our, on our personal home in Rochester on the same day. So we closed on two <laughs> houses the same day, having no money when I began, <laughs> when I began yeah. the whole process. <laughs> this was in residency still or, or right as you were in? Yeah, so, so we closed, what was it, June 22nd or July 22nd? So I either, I had an extra month or month and a half in residency. So I was technically still a resident when, wow. yeah, when we closed. Yeah. yeah. A lot going on, that's for sure. At that time, oh, yeah. you know, twelve unit apartment in a, in a new house. That's awesome. How'd that turn out for you? It actually. T- so uh, this is. I'm glad that you you, you, yeah. you, 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 you even asked that question because now we've actually seen that deal way more than full circle. Nice. So that twelve unit apartment complex, we held it for four years. We sold it mid pandemic, like June 2020. Okay, mm-hmm. we sold it for a profit, a pretty decent profit. I was able to hand mm-hmm. hand the hand hand high investors back, you know, good money with, with profit on top of it. So I was really happy, but here's where it gets interesting. Somehow I'm still on the email list of the realtor that sold that property and he just sold it again. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But he sold it for $40,000 less than what they bought it from us for. Oh, wow. So I was like, score, we made out like bandits. Yeah. (laughs) Yep, I'm a genius. At the right time. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm glad it worked out for you that way. What were some lessons learned buying that 12 unit apartment building in New York? Oh, everything. First lesson was hire a property manager. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and some people will fight me on this on this lesson. Okay. But listen, I was brand new to all of this. I was a resident and then a fellow. Mm-hmm. So there was no way I was going to be spending time learning about New York rental tenant laws. No, yeah. I had zero interest in learning about those things at the time. I'm probably still, honestly. <laughs> um, Agreed. But I hired a property manager who, who was not so big that my property was just a number, but not so small that he didn't have extra hands to help him. Mm-hmm. So I tell people like, you know, find a, a good property manager that is big enough to actually have systems in place. Mm-hmm but small enough to still know your property like that you can call them and be like, Hey, what's going on there? And actually have an answer. <laughs> so that was lesson number one. Number two lesson with that one was make sure you carry good insurance. Okay. Because one day a few years ago, this was probably 2019. I was a few years into my, into my job up here. I'm on call one evening and I get a call and it's my realtor from, from Rochester. And I'm like, you, you don't call me like what's going on. He's like, yeah, someone just called me. I think your apartment is on fire, but <laughs> he's like, yeah, someone, I don't know how they found my number, but they just told me that you're, so anyway, long story short, a tenant set the place on fire. Thankfully, nobody was hurt. And it, it basically took the property out of, out of operations for about three, three or four months, wow. but it gave us basically a brand new, a brand new property at the end of the day, yeah. because our insurance was able to, at, at the time we got replacement costs type insurance. So they basically just re- rebuilt the building. And at the point I, I told our, our investor group and I said, listen, guys, we're selling this right now. <laughs> like yeah. 
this was when things had just began to like rise because now we're talking 2020. I'm sure, well, knowing how much it sold for now, I can't say it, it will still have, have, have gone up. But at the time, things had gone up pretty fairly. And I was like, listen, we just got a, a pretty good rehab on this property. Yeah. This is probably as good as this place is going to look, right? And right. nobody can fault us now for any kind of numbers because it's been baked and because of a fire. So yeah. sell it now. <laughs> And thankfully, they agreed, and we sold it, and we're done. We're out. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a crazy story. Yeah, definitely important to have a great property manager and great insurance. Those are definitely two yeah. pivotal things for sure. What, what, what came next? So the flip, the apartments, the multifamily, yeah. what was next for you? So after we bought that 12 unit, and then we, I finished my fellowship, and we then moved, moved to um, Syracuse for my new job, my husband and I just she said that we we didn't want to necessarily do like syndication style deals anymore. And we wanted to just basically do the deals to the extent that we could handle ourselves financially. So we started buying small multifamily properties. I still like the, I still like the, the idea of multifamily because mm-hmm. I felt, you know, if one tenant hasn't paid and then the, the other would. Yeah. And that was how we, we ended up buying like a bunch of duplexes okay. up there in Syracuse. And we're using the you know Burr strategy, which for those who are new will, will be the buy, rehab, rent, refinance. So basically, you buy a property that that has a lot of upside, you know, you know, a property that 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 needs work. Mm-hmm. You fix it up, making sure that you that, that you that you keep your costs in check, and then when it's all nice and ready and habitable and ready to to go, you have a tenant come in there, sign a lease. And now that you have a lease in place, you now go back to the bank. The bank sees, okay, you have a tenant, you have a lease, we give you money, and you basically get the money out that you used to buy and fix up. Now you can take that pile of cash and do it all over again with a brand new property. So we basically did that across a few properties and ended up, and that became just our, our you know, main investment strategy for, for the next few, few years. It was nice. It was steady. We had, of course, we had learning experiences with those as well, but it kind of just kept me in the game, you know, doing that while working full time, while having babies, while, you know, all this, all that. And it was in, so while I did that, I'll be on the, on the, on the physician Facebook groups or whatever, and just see people posting about their deals. And I was like, well, there's not much at the time, there weren't so many people actually just teaching about real estate in the physician space. So I started talking about it more publicly and started coaching on it. And when talking with people, I'll find people come to me and be like, well, you know, I'm trying to leave my job like yesterday. And I'm like, it's not what I'm doing that would get you out of your job yesterday. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like, right. But I knew that there was that need that people at the time were, were I'm feeling burned out, trying to find ways outside of of medicine. And I was like, okay, there has to be something in real estate that can get you meaningful income in meaningful time. Not Mm the $200 a door type profit that we're talking here with a number of these properties and if, and doing it without necessarily having to put down a ton of cash up front. Yeah. So I basically had like a, a hunt happening in my mind, like, okay, what strategy could people do or use to generate meaningful income in meaningful time, even if they don't have like a ton of cash just sitting waiting to, 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 to be used. So that was when I then kind of explored rental arbitrage, which is kind of what people first started hearing about me talking about in public about. And that is the strategy where, where you basically, you know, rent a property from a landlord, turn it into a short-term rental and profit from the spread in between. So it was that hunt that kind of took me from the the multifamily birth strategy to now, let's now look into short-term rentals. That was my gateway into short-term rentals. That's awesome. Yeah, the the rental arbitrage is is really interesting. I, I'd, I'd like to know more kind of how, how that's been working for you if you're still doing that, because I know sure. definitely some regulations have popped up and sometimes landlords yeah. are a little less friendly to that. But what a cool way to get into short-term rentals with minimal money down. I mean, you're talking about a yeah. security deposit and one month's rent and then furnishing the the unit and then making that spread off of it. So it's a really cool way to, for folks to get involved. And I have some friends who've had just really great success doing that. And then they'll, they'll take that money and then they'll put that money into buying their own short-term rental homes and properties as well. So it's a really cool strategy to generate some more cash flow. Yeah. And so, so, so yeah, exactly what you, what you said. So I actually first heard about it in 2016, 
But it took me about four years from when I first heard about it to actually doing it. Because it just seemed like such a brilliant idea. It was like, oh my goodness, of course, duh. But for <laughs> me, for four years, because now we were in Syracuse, right? And I was like, but nobody's coming to Syracuse. Like, I'm going to be stuck with the rent. And, I, and for four years, I kept saying, I'll be stuck with the rent. But when this, when the whole thing with, with you know, just talking with, with, with doctors came up, I was like, well, you, like, you have to try it somehow. Like, you can't keep telling people, this is a really good strategy for you, but you haven't done it yourself. So what I did at the time was my sister just happened at, at, at the time when I said, okay, you know what? I'm doing this. It also turned out that my sister was also moving. I was moving down to Dallas, Texas. So I was like, you know what? I, Dallas will be a really good market for, for, for this. People actually go to Dallas. So what I did was, again, just like I did with, with, with the first um, on Flip deal, I called, I basically did all the phone work. Anything that, that could be done by phone or email, I did from up here in Syracuse. And in a three-month window, I was able to get 10 apartments that, I, that we then that we turned into short-term rentals. So she became my boots-on-the-ground person, and I was basically doing all the control tower work from, from here. Now, if you're wondering how, how, how I did this in three months, I wasn't at work at the time. And that okay. was the fire in my, you know, behind, because I yeah. had just had my baby. So, yes, I know. I was on maternity leave, okay? Yeah. My baby was one month old. <laughs> Time she wasn't sleeping at night. So guess what I'll be doing? I'm carrying her on my in one hand, and I'm making my phone calls and doing all the things. So I mean, oh, nice. I'll God. send emails. I'll do searches. Yeah. I'll do all these things in the middle of the night while she wasn't sleeping. I'm like, we'll be awake anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, might as well be productive. Get some things done. Might as well make wow. money while we're at it. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. Yeah. How did so that? that how did that work out for you? Yeah. 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 That's how I got the, the 10 units. And at that point, you could not, you could not shut me up because I was like, listen, <laughs> for all the people that say, you know what, I'm not investing in real estate because I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I don't have the whatever. Here is a model that you can use. So I began talking about, about short-term rentals. And then I hosted a conference on short-term rentals, yes. but it was oh, while I hosted that conference that then I began interviewing other doctors who were who were buying their short-term rentals. I was the only person arbitraging among the speakers. Well, not, not, not only, only. There were two other speakers that were doing arbitrage there on that, on that lineup. But of the 20 people that I interviewed, maybe 17 or so were, were buying. But as I listened to them, now, mind you, when I was going into arbitrage, I hadn't even bothered looking into like short-term rentals for buying. Because I felt it was way out of my reach at the time. It, the houses were too big, too expensive. They were, you know, it was so those who like had a lot of dough or whatever. So I basically ruled, ruled myself up. I also said, well, you know, that'll be for a different day. But as I interviewed them, it was like, wait a minute, wait, what? Wait, what? And they just, I kept hearing different things that just made me go, wait, what? So number one was you could use 10% down to buy a short-term rental. And I was like, Everything else that I had done before then was 20% down. Yeah. So I could do 10% down and buy a bigger, better, more profitable house. What? <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> and then I heard of the tax advantages of buying. And I went, okay, so wait, just hold on. So I put 10% down. I buy a property for like, let's just say $500,000. Okay, so 50K down. 50K down with the long-term rental would have bought me a building probably for 250 or maybe even 200 for 25% mm -hmm. down. But now I'm able to buy a $500,000 house that I actually like. Now, I had a separate experience where my where a tenant's dog chased my daughter. Okay. Mm. So now I don't have a tenant that has dogs. I like the house. My kids love the house. And what did you say about the tax benefits again? Okay. Yeah. So in all my investing years, investing in long-term rentals, I had basically, you know, for those who are new, when you buy rental property, there's something called depreciation that you can get, which is like a tax benefit that you can basically write off some of your income, okay? But there was a year in particular where I had 60K in tax losses, but I also had a 60K tax bill on my regular income. And I was like, if only these two who just talk to each other will be good. Yeah. Now... There's a way to make them talk to each other, which is to become a real estate professional. 
But when I looked at the list of what was required, I was like, y'all can keep it because I didn't want anything to do with being a real estate professional spending 750 hours and all, all, all the whole list. If you want to go, you can. So now back to the short-term rental story. So now I find out that with one property, I get higher income from, you know, cash flow. I get, you know, 10% down. And now without being a real estate professional, I can write off the depreciation of my W-2 income. Please, where was the dotted line? Let, let's just sign. Let's just start signing, okay? And I did a major pivot. All of our programs, everything that we did basically shifted from anything long-term rental to short-term rental. Because I said, why would I tell anybody to buy a long-term rental anymore? Right? Why would I tell anybody who has no plans of becoming a real estate professional? Because, by the way, if you work full-time, you can't be a real estate professional. Like, as a doctor or as a professional, like, unless you can right. show that you spend more time in real estate than anything else, you can't qualify as the real estate prof- prof- yeah. professional. So I said, listen, I work with doctors. I work with, with like people that have other things that they're doing. So why would I, you know, waste their time? And okay. And I, sh- I, I shouldn't say waste their time because it's not really wasting their time. It's still building an asset. Yeah. But they can get so much more, so much faster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with short and rentals. Yeah, it's, and that, it's an that awesome. turned turned our attention. So ultimately, the the Dallas arbitrage on properties, we we held for a little while. There was like six of them that actually did not work out, and we just shut down in like a few months because the, the, okay. the building fell apart. I mean, like yeah. yeah, whole different story. And then at some point, Dallas was beginning to crack down on short term rentals as a whole as a city. Mm-hmm. So I didn't renew some leases. So that ended up being actually creating a loss on that front, but I had now learned the skill of managing, operating remote short-term rentals. And I'm like, it's tuition, yeah. but I paid yep. it. And I'm about to cash in on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I was going to ask how the rental arbitrage worked. Uh, yeah. I, I know some folks that have had some, some difficulty with that and, and cash flow, and in some folks that have done really, really well. Yeah. So yeah, definitely interesting. And you know, you bring you bring up a really good point with regulations, and I, I think that's something that we have short term rentals as well, and that's something that mm-hmm. I'm uh, anxious about and keeps me up at night. And honestly, that's a big reason why I haven't bought any more short term rentals is because of regulations. Yeah. What what are what are your thoughts in regards to that? You know, I I'm definitely pro regulation, and I mm-hmm. and we invest in areas that have regulations because it's helpful yep. that there's something that exists, right? But it's it's interesting. We actually we to to kind of fill you in. We we have a really cool geodesic dome property up in the mountains in Colorado. It's in the small rural area, pretty touristy area, about ten minutes from a ski resort. It's beautiful and it's a super cool, super unique property. At the time we bought it, there it was really easy to get a permit, but we actually got the last permit that they issued because then they put in new regulations and we're like, wow, we would have been in so much trouble if that were to happen. Mm-hmm. And so we're really grateful for that, but it's definitely something that, that I know folks are a little anxious about. So what are, what are kind of your thoughts overall for, for regulations in the short-term rental space or ways to kind of combat that? Yeah. So regulations, like you said, are like a double-edged thing, yeah. right? If you get in and your property gets grandfathered in, then congratulations, you just scored. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But if you get in and you don't look up the regulations or the regulations change against you and they don't grandfather anybody in, then that's a problem. So it is something that I drum into people's ears. Like anybody that has an ear, I say it aloud and I say it multiple times. (laughs) You do not pass go. You do not get under contract. You do not imagine. You do not take a realtor's word. You, until you yourself look into the regulations very well. Yep. And this is one tip that I actually give people quite a bit. It is because if somebody actually told me, so now I share it, call, call the city, call the town, call whoever. It, it doesn't an HOA. Call the HOA. Call anybody whose opinion would impact your property to find out if there are any regulations in place or any in the works. Mm-hmm. Because here's the thing, okay? If it's a city regulation issue, before the city would duke it out with all the Airbnb, all you know, the short-term rental hosts and the and the homeowners and all of that, there'll probably be enough time to maybe offload the property, maybe, 
Okay, like Dallas has been going through their own thing for like maybe a good year and a half, yeah. if not two years. Okay, but if if it's like an HOA or condom association type issue, we're talking weeks here. <laughs> you don't have enough time to offload. So I tell people, I generally steer people away from anything with an HOA or condo association. Now, like you mentioned, if you're in a town that depends heavily on tourism income, the chances of them completely outlawing short-term rentals will be fairly yeah. slim. I wouldn't say it's zero, but it'll be slim because they know that their their economy, you know, hangs on on the short-term rental, you know, operators. However, if you're in a city on a, or an urban environment where there are way more, there's way more happening in the town than your short-term rental, the chances of you getting cut increase significantly. So like yeah. my husband, for example, actually like he, he's like, yeah, like I can see, I, he's, he's even pro-regulation. He's like, yeah, they need to like, because there has to be something in place because you can't turn all the houses into short-term right. rentals. And particularly if you're like, you know, in a place that is already landlord, that's already toxic to landlords, landlords, by the time they learn more and more about how much they can make of short-term rentals, there's a reason for them to take away those, those, those off the market. Yeah. So my thing is, you know, try to find cities or towns that either depend heavily on tourism or don't have much else going on that they don't really care much about your, you know, short-term rental operation. Um, yeah. Or simply finding places that that they've already litigated and you know duped out, for lack of a you know technical term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like duped we're, out. We're, that we're, works. They, they've already you know fought through the you know the town hall meetings and the votes and all of that, and finally come up with processes in place. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what what does the portfolio look like for you now, and and kind of what do you guys look for in successful short term rentals? Yeah, so we started out with one property on on Oneida Lake up here, and then last year we basically went on I wouldn't call it a buying spree. So so what happened was <laughs> I saw that when the interest rates shot up, that buying kind of went like screeched to a halt. So mm -hmm. I. At the time, I told my clients and I said, listen, you may be afraid to buy right now, but guess what? This may be the best time to buy because now you're not fighting with, you know, 15 other offers. And so someone was like, well, you're telling people to buy. How about you go buy more? And I was like, all right, well, I'll do it. So I actually ended up buying five, six, I don't know, five or six last year, last year. And, you know, Raise capital because because again my my history had been buying properties that needed work so I bought properties that, that needed work, and so of those oh, I should probably charge my phone of those three so right now three of them are in operation, and three of them are getting rehab. One is close to being done, but we'll probably actually sell that one because it ended up being not lakefront. And my husband is like, well, that one is not lakefront. Let's just stick to yeah. lakefront. And so there are three, I'm losing count now, one, two, <laughs> two more that are lakefront that we're still working on. And then we just closed on one in Crystal Beach, Texas. So are those, those six homes that you bought, are those all on the same lake? So one of them, and I'm, I'm actually trying to count right now, <laughs> one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So four of them are on one lake. Okay. One of them is the one that I said is not on the lake. Yeah. And the, the first one is still, okay. So five on one lake. Oh gosh. Five on one. <laughs> Not that That's a good problem to have. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Five on one lake, one of them on a different lake, and then one in Crystal Beach, Texas. Okay. That's awesome. How are those? The but ones it's a that big are lake. Yeah. 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 Well, you're, and you're taking over too. That's awesome. <laughs> What do you have a, a specific like number of bedrooms that you're looking for, or yeah. style of furnishing, or what what does that look like for you in terms of how intensive of a rehab yeah. and so forth are you doing? Yeah, so in our market where you make for, for me a few things matter. Okay, so for me as I was thinking of okay, what did I actually want to buy? It was actually something that I came across while I was searching for property that became almost like my drive. So I came across a property. It was it was 
the lakefront property that had two other units. So basically three units on one property with like one main house, but three other income, income but crazy units. And the lady was selling it for like 500,000 or so at the time. And she told me her grandfather bought the land and it hit me that, wait, what? Her grandfather basically, like she inherited that. Mm -hmm. And she was about to make half a million dollars from a transaction that she never put a, you know, I mean, she probably, you know, kept up the house and whatnot, but she was about to inherit or basically make $500,000 just from something that she didn't ever buy herself. And I thought to myself, I was like, what if I did something like this for my great grandchildren? Because she owned that, but her, her brother or uncle or something owned the one next door. And another family member owned the one on this side. And I was like, holy smokes, when this grandfather bought this lakefront land, he had no idea what it was going to be, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, or maybe a hundred years, who knows from now. Yeah. So I said that, that I was going to just focus on lakefront land, knowing that while I've had, you know, while I may not be able to tell what will happen in the next hundred years, chances are that lakefront property will have some inherent value just being, just by being there on the lake, irrespective of of what's happening, happening around. So when I researched our market, I found that, you know, four bedrooms and above gives you a really good bang for your buck. Things aren't terribly expensive up here in Syracuse, but the, but by the income from, from four bedrooms are, I mean, it's pretty good. So I focused on getting four bedrooms, but while I was looking, I stumbled upon a seller that was selling three homes in the state, like lakefront homes next to each other. They weren't necessarily four bedrooms, but the first one I thought I could, well, I actually plan to add bedrooms to it. So it's two bedrooms right now, and it's an operation as a two bedroom STR, but I plan to add bedrooms. And the other two are like a two bedroom and a three bedroom. So those aren't necessarily, <laughs> those aren't necessarily yeah. like exactly like I would have bought them if I were searching for them, but I was like, I'll take three houses, you know, and I can combine them into one listing if I, if I needed to. Or not, yeah. That's awesome. And then Crystal Beach, Texas, how did how did you get into that market? So that one actually is a <laughs> I have stories, okay. And you know I can go for days. But <laughs> back in twenty twenty two, okay, that's that that's the story right there. Back in twenty twenty two, I was talking with the friend of mine, trying to figure out, you know, what other markets were out there because I didn't want to put everything on a Nida Lake. And she mentioned Crystal Beach. Crystal Beach at, at the time was still like like an up and coming STR, you know, hub. And so I researched the Wazoo, I, I researched that market like significantly and ultimately kind of, again, found, found the buy box. I, I, I was going for four to five bedrooms, you know, at a good price around the 500s. And I found a property that came up for sale. I got it under contract, but while we were under contract, the interest rates did this major thing. Yeah. And it just was, the numbers just weren't going to work anymore. So I actually backed out and it, as in, I felt so horrible, but I was like, this is like, we just went from a profitable capital situation to like, not even on the map anymore. Mm-hmm. And the, and the sellers sued. So they sued and they went on for a good year and a half. Wow. But recently, you know, Things changed, but for us financially as well as other things. And I was like, you know what? Let's close. And so we yeah. closed on January 12th and now we own wow. it. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> uh, that's a crazy story. You have some great stories. That's for sure. Between fires and lawsuits and uh, all kinds of stuff. That's that's crazy. Hopefully some more like just really smooth sailing, really easy uh, properties to get into and get operating right. in the future for you. But those stories I mean, sometimes it's still worth it, right? I mean, like, like exactly. I, said, I, I, I can go yeah. for days. I can tell. I can yeah. tell lots of stories. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're also an author of the STR Blueprint book. Can you tell us more about that? What made you decide you wanted to write a book? Okay. So it was, in my case, actually, it was it was really just that realization that people weren't hearing enough about about short term rentals, right? Like I went from you know eking out a profit of $200 to $100 a month per, per, you know, property to having one booking, bringing $3,000, one booking, like a, you know, five day booking, $3,000. And it's like, where has this been this whole time? Plus, and then I heard about the tax benefits 
Yeah. And I'm like, people aren't hearing enough about this. And not everybody will come sit in a, you know, a 12 week program or, or, a, you know, a six month or a one year mastermind. No, but everybody, like I, I say it out loud that every doctor needs a Doris. So we, we mm -hmm. call our first lake house Doris. I say every doctor That's needs awesome. a Doris. Like you need something that yeah. you can get away to when you're tired and bored, something that pays for you to hold it and gives you more and something that in the first year puts money back in your pocket. I kid you not. We filed our taxes a bit late last year. Actually, no, no, no. Very late last year. Let's, let's yeah. be real. Who did too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We all, yeah. It's like, yeah. it's not even a thing. But what the day that I got the tax return from the daughter's property was on my birthday. Mm -hmm. My birthday is November yeah. 1. Okay. It was such a beautiful birthday gift. <laughs> yeah, I bet it Imagine was. waking up on your birthday yeah. to like a multiple five figure deposit from the yeah. IRS. Yeah. When I tell you it is such a good feeling, yeah. you're like, who else needs to hear this? One of my clients got back $140,000 tax wow. return. Yeah. Okay. Anesthesiologist, her taxable income was eleven thousand dollars last year okay Jeez. yeah <laughs> yeah that's crazy in her case she bought three short-term rentals mm -hmm. so i'm like i need i'm not i'm not even shouting it loud enough the book is just the beginning no but just just get ready to be get ready to see me around because not i'm enough excited people, not enough people know about this very i call it a simple strategy because you're because eventually it turns into you taking what you would have paid in taxes and turning it into a down payment. I mean, you put a down payment first, but then you get it back in the form of a tax refund. Right. Now you can basically do it all over again. So instead of paying the taxes, you're buying an asset. An asset that appreciates, yeah. that you can pass on to your kids, that generates cash flow. You can spend time in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's an awesome perk. I will say one thing to folks listening, though, I, it's never a good idea to buy a house just because of tax benefits. You still have to make sure the fundamentals are there. You still have to make sure that you're that you're going to cash flow. You're still going to have to make sure that the numbers work, which I know is really important to you as well. But sometimes I think folks hear that, hey, six figures because of tax benefits and the depreciation and jump right to it and don't want anybody to get in a sticky situation for sure. I am so glad you said that. Because that that sentence right there is the reason that we that I that we do what we do. Because yeah. Yeah. I have met people who are like, well, you know, last year we did the whole thing, you know, we got the tax benefits. Okay, now what? It's like, mm -hmm. well, now you operate the short term rent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now you operate the short term, short -term rent. Do something with it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's super important. But it is, it is true though. I mean, it's such a great way to offset your income, but it's also a way that gets forgotten about in terms of returns from a real estate perspective. You know, we have the cash flow, the appreciation, the tax benefits. And, and so it's a great way to, to, to also benefit, you know, and so, and then of course the depreciation benefit as well. So that's really cool. Yeah. Short-term rentals, they're, they're fun. They're awesome. We, we really enjoy it. We've pivoted more to the residential assisted living space for numerous reasons, but, but the short-term rental space will always have a soft spot in our heart and we do enjoy that as well. That's awesome. Well, what's, what's next for you? I know shouting this more from the rooftops, which I'm excited about and the book being the start. So what, what's coming after the book? So I've actually been looking at buying businesses. So it's funny when you talk about residential assisted living, in 2019, just before the pandemic, I actually looked into, into Ariel's and it oh, definitely really? has a place in my heart because yeah. I really wanted to do it uh, and I haven't done it yet. But yeah. right now I'm looking into business acquisitions. Okay. Again, that, that I can go off on a whole yeah. thing on. But basically, that's like more of like a cash flow play mm -hmm. where you can buy a business with the same amount of money as you, as you would a short-term rental and get... 10x the the yeah. the cash flow. I have all of yeah. that on like you know YouTube channel and whatnot. And Dr. Fowler, if you're looking for that, but again, it's like you see something and you can't unsee the numbers. <laughs> but RALs are actually like right in between, right in between short-term rentals and businesses. You have residential mm -hmm. living. Yeah, I I think yeah. you know we. 
if we're looking back, you know, over time from real estate, you know, short-term rentals were really hot. Those were the big thing. Now it's buying small businesses. Yeah. I think residential assisted living is going to come next. I think we're a couple, a couple years off from that, but uh, I think it's a really great opportunity as well. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, we'll have to, we'll have to bring you back and talk more about some small business acquisition and what to look for and what that looks like at some point in the future. But for now, where can folks buy the book, the SDR blueprint and where can folks reach out to you if they want to learn more? Yeah. So if they go to the, the STR book.com, I snagged domain oh. and I was like, yes. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> the, the STR book.com. You will find both how to get the actual book as well as the um, free bonuses, which are like a free calculator to see if you're profitable, our tech stack and interview with an accountant to kind of, you know, talk about all the tax stuff that's on the claim, the bonuses button, but and when you claim the bonuses, you also then get into our, our you know, our email, you know, newsletter feed mm -hmm. and all of that. So people can then kind of stay in touch. But to find That's me, awesome. Facebook, I am on yeah. Facebook. I am very present on Facebook. I am the only Chia Gauzier Fowley, almost in the world, <laughs> but definitely on Facebook. I have two accounts. So if you see both, any of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, it's been really cool following your journey on Facebook. And I've, I've learned a lot just through your Facebook page. So keep up the good work there. Keep sharing all the good things that you're doing. And oh, we'll we'll you. include uh, the links there in the show notes as well. So folks can find the book and get into the email pipeline. Well, Dr. Falloway, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I know it's, uh, it's late in Syracuse me. time. So really appreciate it. And we'll have to have you back on the show again in the future. Hey, It'll be my pleasure. I have, I have fun with these. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a blast. Well, with that, it's been another episode of the Physicians and Properties podcast with Dr. Chiagazi Fallaway and Dr. Alex Schlo signing off. Hey, real quick. If you're still listening to this, I'm assuming you got value from it. So I need your help specifically. My two-year vision with this podcast is to help 100,000 physicians learn how investing in real estate can give you the freedom to practice medicine and live life how you want. There are two main ways that a podcast grows. One is the ratings and reviews, and the other is word of mouth. If you can please leave me a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, as well as send this to one to two friends that you think would get value from it, we can reach the physicians that we want to reach. Thanks in advance, and talk to you on the next episode. Please note that the information shared on this podcast is for informational purposes only. It should not be considered financial or medical advice. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the host and the guests, and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Department of Defense or the United States Air Force.